It's a pleasure to have uh, Chandra Raman with us today. Uh, Chandra got his uh, bachelor's degree uh, in electrical and electronics engineering from Caltech and then a master's degree in the same subject from the University of Michigan, go blue, um, and then his PhD in applied physics also from Michigan. Uh, after a postdoc at MIT, he came to Georgia Tech in 2001 where he's currently an associate professor of physics. Um, he was elected a fellow of APS uh, in 2013, I think, and, um, and also one of the interesting things I saw in his bio was that um, he took a leave of absence during his uh, time here at Georgia Tech to work for two and a half years at a company, AOSense, um, and then brought back what he learned uh, to his lab here, his academic lab, so it's an interesting uh, thing. Anyway, it's a great to have him, and I'll turn this over to him. All right. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is that better? So this is, uh, this is a lapel better. Is that good? Can you guys hear me? Can you folks hear me in the back? Okay, all right, good. Okay, well thanks for the kind introduction. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've, as uh, David said, I've been at Georgia Tech since 2001. But this is the first time I'm giving a seminar at IEN. So, and that's a reflective of the fact that uh, for the first time in my research career, I'm actually doing things that might be of interest to, to people here. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've started up some research areas that I think will be interesting to explore some possible collaborations. Uh, and. Um, and so I hope uh, I, I can convince you that some of these things are very interesting. And the world of atoms is one which might be of interest to, to engineers particularly. Okay, great. So uh, the title of my talk is Quantum Sensing with Atoms. And uh, quantum is a buzzword that's really popular nowadays. And uh, uh, there's something called the National Quantum Initiative. There's been a lot of interest. Hopefully there will be some funding as well that goes along with it. Uh, new funding in the area of trying to do uh, quantum-based sensing and quantum-based computation, which you probably have heard something about. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about, about this topic of quantum sensing using atoms. Uh, neutral atoms, this are sort of a pictorial representation of that. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, the National Science Foundation ONR and the AFOSR, which uh, has supported the work that I'll be telling you about today. Okay, great. So here's just a picture of my uh, group at the moment, and I'd like to thank some of the students that have been involved in this research. Uh, and our research areas are basically divided into two in my group. There's one part which does research on ultra-cold atoms. So these are atoms very close to absolute zero that are trapped. This is a, a sample of 10 to the 6 atoms suspended in a vacuum chamber. And the motivation for this research is to try to simulate condensed matter systems or more complex systems, although this is a gas. Uh, and the idea is to examine things like quantum magnetism, many-body quantum dynamics, quantum entanglement in a system that is very well controlled and which you very precisely know all the parameters. Uh, and hopefully that will shed some insights into complex phenomena such as high temperature superconductivity. And maybe one, one day might have some applications. Uh, there's another part of my research which is more directly application related and that's uh, an attempt to try to bring at atomic instruments into the realm of microfabrication. To try to make miniature devices, um, chip scale, atomic clocks, atom interferometers, and eventually to do inertial sensing using, using uh, atoms on a chip. And so this is uh, an area I'll be uh, telling you. So this will be the first uh, part of my talk. We'll dwell on this area. And uh, depending on the time, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about what we're doing with ultra-cold atoms. Uh, so just to thank some of our other GT collaborators. We also started a collaboration with Farouk Ayazi's group here in ECE and uh, his students and uh, have been helping out my students to build some nice devices. We have a couple of papers that 
We have written together based on the research I'll be telling you here, and we have a patent application as well. And uh, we've also started a project with Ali Adibi's group, also in ECE, uh, in nanophotonics that's just getting started. OK, so let me back up and uh, start this talk by saying, what are atomic instruments, really? Uh, you may have heard about atomic clocks. But what are the advantages for building an instrument using atoms? So the key advantages are that atoms are a highly accurate way of keeping track of time. They're very precise, and they're very repeatable. So if I build, uh, so this is a, a, a graph from this uh, paper from the NIST group that uh, built two atomic clocks based on terbium atoms. They called them a terbium-1 and a terbium-2. Now, if you go out and buy two clocks, they're never going to give you the same time forever. However, these two clocks are made of the identical atom. They're both the terbium atoms. And so there's a very high degree of correlation between the two. And this, uh, this repeatability means that you can build these clocks all over the place, and they're all going to read the same time. Now, that's a very important uh, advantage. However, this is a tabletop instrument. So what advantages are infer con conferred by solid state instruments? They're highly integrable. So you can put a whole bunch of things together. You can manufacture them at low cost. These are very expensive things to put together. Uh, and they have to be done by hand at present. And so there's no real prospect for mass manufacture. And it's also difficult to make these, these uh, atomic instruments low power. There's a lot of lasers. There's a lot of power supplies. There's a lot of things that go into this that are bulky and consume a lot of power. Uh, but uh, for example, a solid state uh, um, sensor or clock uh, might just be an atom inside of a, or a vacancy inside of a piece of uh, crystalline matter. And it can be very low power. You can put all the electronics very close to it. And I think that this is a huge advantage of the solid state. But atoms still have the accuracy and repeatability. And so if there's a way to move atoms to chip scale, perhaps we can get some of the benefits of solid state by having access to, for example, being able to integrate all, all, the, uh, all the controls around the, this, this sensor. And uh, we can do that with atoms, because after all, the individual atoms that are in these clocks are themselves very tiny. So there's no ultimate limit to how small you can make them. It's really an engineering challenge to try to bring all that to the small scale. Engineering and a science challenge. OK, so I was told that there'd be many students in the audience here. So I want to back up and say, well, from a fundamental point of view, what's going on? Why are atoms so good? Atoms are so good at keeping time, for example, because of one thing. They have discrete energy levels that are unique to the atom. So the energy states of one rubidium atom, this is the hyperfine structure of the rubidium atom with one particular isotope, the rubidium-87 isotope, has, uh, has a so-called hyperfine structure. That hyperfine structure is very weakly coupled to the outside world, uh, only through external magnetic fields. And then even though the energies depend on this magnetic field, x is a symbol for the magnetic field. I didn't draw this graph. I borrowed it from Steve Jefferts, who's a uh, uh, atomic clock scientist at, at NIST. Uh, but uh, there are states that are very, very strongly sensitive to the magnetic field. But there are some that are very weakly sensitive to magnetic fields. And those are the ones that are used to make an atomic clock. In fact, they're used to make the atomic clocks that are used in GPS base stations. So how good is that clock? Well, the number of digits known is very high. And if you uh, if you have an oscillator that's slave to this transition, you can keep time very accurately. The other thing that I mentioned, uh, similar to the ytterbium clocks that I showed you in the earlier slide, is there's no variability from one atom to the next, except insofar as it might have a weak dependence on the environment that it's in. But that can be hopefully something controlled very carefully. It's very stable over time and highly accurate. So you can make a precise clock. But even if it's not all that precise, it's extremely accurate. 
So what kind of precision instruments are there? After all, the hyperfine structure of rubidium has been known for many decades. So people have known that you could build very precise atomic clocks. What, what type of clocks are there out there? In fact, there are many instruments that you can buy. So here's an atomic clock that's a beam-based clock that's very precise, made by a company called Oscilloquartz. It was uh, a competitor to this HP uh, 50, uh, sorry, 4071A, which was a mainstay of, uh, of, uh, of naval navigation for a long time. Uh, and so this, this clock is something that sits in a rack mount, and it has a little atomic beam inside of it. Unfortunately, not so little atomic beam. It's actually a big atomic beam. Uh, and uh, this, this clocks are very accurate, so they can have a precision of 10 to the minus 14, absolute accuracy of 10 to the minus 12. But they're expensive. So, okay, if you want one of these clocks, it costs tens of thousands of dollars. You can buy one for 10K on eBay, but if you want to buy it new, then it's going to be more expensive than that. There's also no prospect for volume manufacturing. So each one of these has to be assembled carefully. It's not something that can be stamped out uh, in a large number. And they're not portable. This is rack mount and heavy. So where do we go from here? How does one make things smaller? Well, atomic physicists like myself are good at building things that fit on an entire optical table. So an optical table that's 5 feet by 12 feet, here, this one's uh, from a PhD thesis from Stanford University, and this is an atom interferometer gyroscope. So there's an atomic beam inside of this steel uh, uh, can here, and uh, it uh, can be used because the atoms are moving in the vacuum and they are sensitive to inertia, it can be used to build a very sensitive gyroscope. In fact, this PhD thesis demonstrated micro degree per root hour sensitivities for a gyroscope, minimum sensitivities, which is navigation grade and below. Uh, and, uh, but, but unfortunately, it's on a tabletop size and it's very difficult to make it smaller. So the point of this is that portability and cost solutions would really enable applications in navigation, geolocation, etc. So finding uh, ways to make these instruments portable and disseminate, being able to disseminate them widely would go a long way towards practical applications. So people have been working on making chip scale devices for atoms. And so I wanted to review some of that. So what are people doing in the world of atomic physics trying to make things smaller and more portable? So there's, this falls into two categories. There are devices using cold atoms. So these are atoms that have been laser cooled and brought to temperatures close to uh, absolute zero. I'll tell you a little bit about that towards the end of the talk in my section on, on uh, quantum simulation. But the idea is that cold atoms can be actually brought to a chip and then trapped above the chip surface using some wires. The wires, uh, you can run a current through the wire and then it uh, confines the atoms because of their magnetic moment. Uh, and then you can send laser beams in and probe the atoms. This was actually an application where you can uh, actually, because the atoms are magnetically sensitive, you can make little magnetic maps of the surface that are pretty sensitive. Um, just using the atoms. However, there are lots of issues with this kind of technology. Uh, one of the main issues is that although the coherence times are very long, so you can have coherence times for the sample that are seconds, uh, that's much higher than in any solid state system, NMR, etc. Uh, but the, the problems with this are duty cycle issues. So you can't really measure the atoms all the time. You have to spend some time cooling them down and trapping them and waiting for them to get into the right frame of mind so that you can use them for your sensor application. Okay, and atoms are a little finicky. They'd like to, you know, they take some time to settle in. And that's a problem if you want to measure something that's dynamically changing, then if you have a duty cycle, you're, you're going to miss out on some of the dynamics and it'll introduce extra noise. Uh, and so that is one of the main issues, plus the complexity of the uh, apparatus that's needed in order to trap and cool the atoms is significant and, and a lot of progress needs to be made on making that uh, more, uh, more portable. On the other hand, atoms can easily come for free in a vapor. I can go out and buy some rubidium atoms for 50 bucks and uh, there I have many, many, many atoms that I can use. So I can put some in, in a little uh, 
vapor cell. This is a MEMS fabricated vapor cell. This came from a, a, a review by John Kitching's group, uh, John Kitching himself at NIST. Uh, on on the, the state of such sensors, this was used to build a chip scale atomic clock and also magnetometers are built this way. Little MEMS fabricated vapor cells and you heat them up and then you have a vapor of atoms and you can use that vapor of atoms. Uh, the advantage of that is that it's very much simpler technology than the cold atom world. However, the disadvantage is that you still don't have uh, very long coherence times like you do in the cold atom world. So my group, we looked at this paradigm and we started to say, well, is there a way to get some of the benefits of the simplicity of this hot atom systems, but still retain some of the coherence properties of the uh, cold atom world? So can one get the benefits of both worlds in some way? And so we started to talk to some of our ECE colleagues over here, and we explored some new ideas. And that's what I think is great about Georgia Tech, is that uh, as a scientist, you can go out and talk to some engineers, and they'll tell you some cool things that you can do. They can also set you straight and tell you, well, that's ridiculously hard. So we need that balance. Uh, but the idea that we've sort of pl been playing around with is a vapor cell is a box and the atoms are moving in all directions and eventually they en encounter the walls. And when they encounter the walls, that's a problem because the atoms lose their memory sometimes uh, after a certain number of collisions with the wall. Uh, and so it's not the best thing for making a, a very precise uh, instrument. You really want the atoms to be isolated and, and not go anywhere. So there's vacuum inside this wall except for the atoms. Uh, and so we thought, well, what if our atoms were all traveling in the same direction? So this is a vapor cell. The atoms are traveling in all directions. The atoms are all traveling in the same direction. That's called an atomic beam. Uh, and then at least as far as the atoms don't reach the end of the sensor, they're not encountering anything at all. So they won't bounce off the, the walls. And they have very few chances to bounce off each other either because they're just making one transit. And so could this be a useful device for making a, a sensor or a clock? And the answer is yes. So atoms don't touch the wall. Uh, the other important thing is that Doppler broadening is eliminated. So the, here the atom's velocity is in all directions. But here the, uh, the velocity vector is, is pointing in this direction. So if I sent a laser beam perpendicular to that direction, I would have zero Doppler shift. Okay, so Doppler broadening is eliminated, so you can do precise spectroscopy, certainly. Uh, and you can also build uh, a clock using this method. You can interrogate the atoms here, and then at some later time interrogate the atoms here. But the time is not real time, it's just the transit time of the atoms. So in fact, this is a continuous laser beam, this is a continuous laser beam, and the atoms uh, can go from one to the other, and the second laser beam detects the coherence that was created by the first laser beam. This is a well-known technique called Ramsey spectroscopy, and the single particle coherence can lead to uh, a clock because the atom's internal energy levels evolve from one uh, Ramsey zone to the next. Okay, well, there are possibilities that maybe one could even exploit uh, uh, collective properties of the atoms, but even if you didn't do that and you just had single particle coherence, this type of clock is useful because the atoms don't encounter the wall in between the two zones. And because of that, it's potentially a way to make a, a, a very accurate sensor. So that's a, a, an application that we're currently pursuing. Okay, so, <coughs> so what are the challenges in miniaturization? So I told you about miniature vapor cells. So that's actually a fairly mature technology now. So you can start out with a vapor cell that's a centimeter in size. So this is a little uh, a glass cell in which there's a little bit of rubidium that's been put inside, or cesium, alkali metals. See, rubidium and cesium are, are typically useful for making clocks and magnetometers. Uh, and then it can be shrunk down to the millimeter scale by using MEMS fabrication. So this is a piece of silicon. There's uh, some patterns that have been etched through. And then there's glass bonded to both sides with the little bit of rubidium inside. And you can shrink things down to the millimeter scale using this, this kind of technique. And, and so that's, that's pretty powerful. So the problem is with atomic beams is that they're long. <laughs> 
And so you're not starting with something that's a centimeter and trying to make it a, meet, a millimeter. We're starting something with something that's a meter in size. Okay? Similar to what I showed you on that first slide with the uh, atom interferometer gyroscope. And it, it has to be a meter in size. This is a picture of an atomic beam uh, apparatus in our laboratory that we use for uh, laser cooling. And to take that from a meter size down to something really small in the millimeter size uh, seems very challenging at first. So what are the principles, the physical principles, that make it a meter? Why does it have to be a meter? Why couldn't I have started with something smaller? And it turns out that there's good scientific reasons why it's that size. And you have to, if you want to try to, the message is that if you want to try to miniaturize some thing, you have to understand the physical principles that require it to be that size that it started. So here is an atomic beam. So how did I get all my atoms to travel in the same direction when they started out in a, in a vapor in which they were traveling in all directions? So this is the cleverest dumb trick in the world. You just take a box and you put a hole in it. And as long as there's vacuum everywhere, then the atoms will slowly effuse out of this little hole. And they'll effuse out with a cosine theta distribution. So the atoms that travel at a large angle uh, are suppressed by uh, the cosine of theta. So at 90 degrees, there's nothing. But it's still a fairly broad dis distribution. On axis, there's 100% probability. And then I simply put another aperture downstream, and I get rid of all of these atoms that are traveling at an angle. So then I have a beam of atoms whose velocity vector is more or less in the forward direction. And I filtered out all of the other atoms. However, that's OK, because I had a lot of atoms to start with, and uh, I can afford to do that to make a clock. OK, so those rack-mounted clocks are doing exactly that. They're filtering out the atoms. OK, but why, the, why does it have to be the size it is? It's because, simply because of the geometry. If you're trying to do this filtering, and I want to pass atoms through the first nozzle, and then have them be filtered through the second nozzle, and I want a reasonable uh, divergence angle, and if I want my source size to be not too small, then it uh, is say if it's twenty, if it's two millimeters in diameter, and I want ten milliradian of collimation angle here, then it has to be twenty centimeters long, and that's the way that that's what makes it that size. It's not just simply because of of habit or anything like that. It's just really the way that this device is designed. OK, so can we fix that? Yes, we can fix that. There's been a solution to that that's been known for a very long time. It's called a capillary array. And so uh, the way it's done is to draw a bunch of glass tubes. And then you shrink down the size of each tube so it's very small. So I have the same aspect ratio in terms of the length of the device to the size of each pore. But I didn't have to make my whole device 25 microns. I can have a whole array of them. I still get a reasonable flux of atoms coming out in order to make a sensor. OK, so this capillary array is great. It's, uh, it's an array of tubes. It has a large aspect ratio. So the beam that comes out is collimated. So let's try to understand the principle behind that. OK, so I have a box full of atoms here. <clears throat> OK, and uh, this looks like. It's really just a cartoon drawing. But in fact, it's a Monte Carlo simulation. And uh, there's a tube attached to this box. The atoms bounce around inside the tube and eventually come out. But there's more of them that tend to come out without hitting the tube walls at all. Okay? As long as there is not a hydrodynamic flow inside the tube, uh, you'll get a beam of atoms coming out on axis. And uh, you still get some atoms coming out to the side. But the atoms that were coming out to the side actually that are bouncing off the walls of the tube actually have a good probability of coming back to the source and not uh, leaving. So the flat flux on axis is about the same as you would have for a cosine emitter, but you have more of a directed beam. Nonetheless, if you look at the angular distribution of the flux coming out here, that angular distribution extends to all angles. And in fact, if you look at the, for this type of aspect ratio, if you look at the atoms coming out with outside of the, uh, so if you look at the flux between 0 degrees and the half angle, let's say the half width at half maximum of this angular distribution, the area under that is only 1% of the total flux. So even though you've produced a nice collimated beam, 
you're still spraying out a lot of uh, flux to the sides. So the, the off-axis flux is reduced due to wall collisions. It's a simple device to make, uh, but the beam purity is not very good. You still have a large off-axis uh, contribution. <clears throat> so if you're making a miniature sensor, you can certainly start with a device that's miniature like this. However, there's still a lot of uh, extra vapor that's produced, and that could cause a problem for building a precise instrument because that vapor interrogates your, is interrogated by your laser beam as well. Okay, so, so we started to talk to our uh, electrical engineering colleagues about this, and uh, Farouk and I, Farouk Ayazi and I sat down one day and just started to think about what we could do with silicon fabrication. Could we do something to make atomic beams using silicon? And we came up with this concept of trying to make a planar device. So the idea here is that the, instead of using a capillary array, we would use uh, tubes made out of silicon. So this is a <clears throat> device that they fabricated for us. It's a silicon collimator. It has little holes etched into uh, silicon, and another wafer is bonded on top. And uh, the cross-section of these tubes is 100 micron by 100 micron, so it's pretty small. Uh, certainly from the point of view of, of uh, atomic beam devices, it would, be, it would be entirely appropriate for us. And so we made a, a set of collimators that had a 100 micron cross-section and 3 millimeter channel length. And so we, we, you, know, you might ask, what's the point of doing this when the capillary arrays exist? The point of doing this is that these features are defined in photolithography. So they're not drawn glass tubes. Here, you can just pattern it to be whatever you want. It's completely uh, flexible, and you can make feature sizes that are microns or even possibly smaller. And here's the key. It's really easy to integrate this with other things. So for example, optoelectronics is something where you could then imagine that the atoms coming out of one of these tubes interacts with some optoelectronic device. Okay? And it's right there. Everything can be fabricated together. That's the vision. So I'll uh, briefly tell you about the fabrication process, but only because I've learned about it. I didn't actually do it. <laughs> uh, so this is the way it's done, apparently. Uh, you start out with silicon, and you do deep RIE etching uh, after oxide growth. So there's an oxide growth la layer that's put on, and then it's etched. Uh, and then we take another wafer and uh, put a gold layer on top, and then flip it on top and bond the two together using a silicon gold eutectic bond. So there may be other ways to do this bonding that we're exploring right now and thinking about. But then this whole structure becomes sealed, and then it's diced to millimeter lengths. Uh, so in, in now we have this device that's only three millimeters in size. <coughs> so here are some of the microchannels you can make. So we, can't, we don't need to necessarily have what you can do with drawn glass capillaries, straight microchannels. But we can make microchannels with different wall sizes. So here's a 10 micron wall uh, with 100 micron width. We are able to make that. And this is a cross section of that before the uh, top wafer was put on that shows that they're really straight and nice. Uh, so they did a great job with making these. So this device has 90% open fraction for the atoms, which is great because we don't lose any flux by having walls, really. Uh, the other neat thing, and this is something you can do using lithography that you can't do with my machining. Okay, you can make channels that focus in some place. So the atoms would all focus to some point in space. You can make two beams that have two different uh, angles of divergence uh, with respect to each other. That might be useful for some applications. <clears throat> uh, so we made a bunch of these. And then how do we test them? So we test them by putting them inside a copper tube on the end of a copper tube. And there's rubidium inside the copper tube. And the whole thing sits inside a test chamber that's at 10 to the minus 6 tor vacuum. That vacuum level is, is good enough for us to, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it, it's certainly easy to get this vacuum with this kind of test chamber, but it does not need to actually be that high. Probably even millitor uh, to 100 microtor would be, would be adequate. Um, but this is just a convenient uh, vacuum level, and then we can interrogate the atoms inside this test chamber. So how do we detect the atoms and how do we interrogate them? Let me make sure I'm 
so <clears throat> we use fluorescence detection. So we start with a diode laser that's at 780 nanometers. That's resonant with the rubidium atoms, and then we shine that light directly into the chamber, but it's perpendicular to the direction of the atomic beam. So the light interacts with all the atoms, regardless of their velocity. As I mentioned earlier, there's no Doppler shift. And then we use simply collect the fluorescence using a photodiode. So this is collected fluorescence on a camera that shows you the output of each of these channels. So these are 20 microchannels here, and every single one of them <coughs> excuse me, is operating. So the atoms come out with a longitudinal velocity of around 300 meters per second. And we're only sensitive to their transverse velocity. That is, the, the beam is moving to the right, but we're sensitive to their velocity in the direction perpendicular to the beam. And you can collect this on a photodiode. You have to be a little bit careful about using low noise uh, current amplification, which we learned how to do, and is, uh, is pretty good. So what does the spectrum look like? So now I scan my diode laser, and uh, I scan it over about 1 gigahertz of frequency range. And I hit this resonance where the, uh, uh, of the D2 line of rubidium. And uh, within that resonance, there are several peaks that correspond to different hyperfine levels in the excited state. Within one peak, the, say the central peak, that's the strongest one, the, the, the line has a width that uh, is narrow but has a long tail, as you can see. And that long tail is precisely the long tail of the angular distribution of the collimator. It's the velocity of atoms at very large angles that are emitted because they are diffusely scattering off the walls. And we can see that in the spectrum directly. Okay, the red curve is just saturated absorption that's used as a calibration marker that shows you that there's a rubidium peak. So this is from a rubidium vapor cell. So we start to get data like this and we said, hey, collimator's working. There are actually atoms coming out and they're in a narrow beam. <coughs> so what can we do that's different? What can we do that's new that you can't do in other respects. And here's what we can do. We can build a, so I showed you this ordinary collimating device that produces a, a beam and as well as the, the halo that surrounds it. But on chip, we can make a cascade of these tubes. And that's very hard to do using glass collimators because you have to align them all. But here they're self-aligned by the lithography process. And all we have to do is etch some gaps. So we etch gaps in the collimator. That's a little bit more tricky because it's a two-dimensional device. You have to etch it, and then you have to make sure that the rubidium vapor can escape from those gaps. And so my student, Chao Li, who worked on this, was really very good with his hands and, and aligning things. Uh, you know, so I should say that you know, as, a, as a physics uh, lab, we're used to doing things that are a centimeter size, but he got good at making things millimeter size and even smaller with his hands. Of course, in the clean room, it's easy to do that. But, uh, but in, in a, uh, when you're building something by hand, it's tricky. Anyway, he was able to do, uh, take these, uh, these collimators that had a gap etched into them and align them in such a way that the atoms could escape from the gaps. And now here's what happens. So now if an atom diffuses off of the walls, it has a chance to be pumped out in one of these gaps. But the atoms that were traveling down the tube did not have any, to them, this, this tube looks the same as this tube. It's no different. It's only the atoms that are off axis that are affected. So the, the on axis beam brightness is the same. However, the off axis atoms are all gone now. Okay, that's because they've been pumped out within the source. And so this device has never been built before, and we built it in our lab. And the way we etched the gaps, in the first iteration, we took that same silicon dye and, uh, and Jeremy Yang uh, diced, used a dicing blade to just cut out the, uh, the, top, uh, the top wafer. So you can see the, uh, the channels underneath it, uh, but he just etched gaps in the, in the wafer. So the, the atoms could escape. In more recent uh, iterations, we've also used laser cutting to, to remove the, to, to make the gaps. But in, I know that some of you are engineering students. I was an electrical engineering student as an undergraduate. It's nice to think of things in terms of circuits. 
So here's a circuit model of the collimator. So the, a circuit you can think of as a resistor here. The atoms enter at one end and leave at the other. That's like a current flow. And the resistance is really the drop in the pressure as you go through. And the difference between a single collimator and a cascaded collimator is that there are shunt resistances. And so you can develop this kind of uh, shunt resistance model that shows you there's actually an exponential suppression of the flux okay, as, as you increase the number of stages. So that's a nice model way of thinking about it. Uh, but the on-axis flux is not captured by this. It's simply the ballistic transport of atoms through the tube. So that's not affected. So what happens when you build one of these? So the blue curve was the data I just showed you a few minutes ago on the collimator. The red curve is the data from the cascaded collimator, the one that has the gaps etched. And you can see that the peak height is almost the same. In fact, because of the way we make the measurement, it obscures the fact that the flux is actually exactly the same. And that's because of the, uh, the fact that the, the laser beam that's interrogating the atoms has a finite size. However, the off-axis flux is completely suppressed. So you can really see clearly this, uh, this hyperfine peak here, this one here, and this one here, but there's no contribution from the wings anymore. Okay, and so the, if you measure the full width half maximum of these two collimators, the cascaded collimator and the ordinary collimator, they're not too different within a factor of two or so of each other, uh, but the wings are suppressed greatly. So you can't tell that really by looking at this graph, but if you, <clears throat> but if you plot it on a log scale, and here's where the low noise current uh, amplification was necessary, you really see that there's a big suppression of a factor of 40 or so. Uh, actually, th this ratio is actually more like 70, but the integrated suppression is about 40. And so this uh, suppression was, uh, was all with the same, it, it, so the, the on-axis flux is roughly the same, but the off-axis flux is suppressed by a factor of 70, and that's because of the, uh, that's because of the gaps that we etched into the collimator. So although this device had these two devices have the same length. They're only three millimeters in size. Uh, the, <clears throat> the collimation purity is much higher in terms of these off-axis flux. Now to achieve the same thing using a macroscopic atomic beam would be about 20 centimeters in length. So we did all that within three millimeters of length. So we were very excited by this. We thought this is really the possibility for making miniature devices because you can do all this stuff on the, on the micro scale. So we also have a nice patent application on this that's uh, currently going through, <coughs> as well as a paper in Nature Communications that appeared last year. Uh, so what have we done since then? Uh, oh, sorry, before I get to that, I just want to mention that you can deconvolve this, and it gives you the velocity distribution of the atoms. Uh, it's not actually that easy to predict that from first principles, but we have Monte Carlo methods that can be used to, to obtain it. But the deconvolution from the spectrum matches up with this Monte Carlo simulations quite well and gives you a half width, half maximum of four meters per second. <coughs> what about throughput? So does this work as well as, as some other methods might be? Uh, and uh, the answer is yes. So uh, you can get up to 10 to the 10, a few 10 to the 10 atoms per second per tube, which is a large number of atoms. You can do a lot with that. Uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, the throughput, the total throughput for the cascaded collimator and the uh, single stage collimator are consistent with what you would expect from an effusive model. Okay, so since then we've done some longer term tests as well to determine the reliability of this collimator. So we built one of these and put it in a little chamber and left it there for six months. Okay. So it's been running for six months, and during that time we change the temperature every so often, but we measure the flux at regular intervals, and the measured throughput is actually pretty constant over time. And then we could periodically, at the places that are marked by the arrows, take images of the, of the collimators with the camera and see that all the different channels are operational. And during the six months, uh, we haven't seen even one of these channels get clogged. So I'm very excited about this because it, it suggests that this could po potentially be a device that gets put into service for potentially for years. And I'm very excited about it. Uh, all the, uh, um, this, uh, this testing we've done at different temperatures means that 
uh, it, it's equivalent to sort of 100 degree C operation uh, for, for two years. Unfortunately, we didn't have uh, the ability to keep the test going for longer, but I, I would like to be able to do that in the future. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so I'll, uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? I'm probably running a little bit low on time. So I think I'm going to skip this part. I'll just tell you that another aspect of uh, of this kind of microscale manipulation of the atoms is that you can position them very close to nanostructures. And I mentioned that uh, one could uh, imagine single atoms crossing through a resonator and uh, a photonic resonator and, and one could imagine a strong coupling between the single atom and a single photon that's in this resonator. That's the limit we'd like to get to. Uh, the idea being that this is the sort of thing that people have done with cold atoms but here, maybe one could do it using thermal atoms. And then this could be a quantum device uh, that could be scaled to large numbers. Um, so that's an, something we're working on in collaboration with Ali Adibi's group. He's built some resonators for us. Here are some first resonators that he built. They haven't yet been tested. They're kind of, the optical characterization is in process. But these are resonators that are 100 microns in length. And we would bring our collimator very close to these uh, to these res uh, res uh, resonators, and then atoms would cross through the resonator and interact with the single photons. So that's the idea. It's an experiment that's kind of in process, and uh, look forward to more results on that in the future. So uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the uh, um, uh, about the cold atom work, but I see that I'm I'm running quite a bit behind. <laughs> so uh, I think I'll skip ahead and just uh, conclude at this point. Uh, if you want to hear a little bit about cold atoms, please come by and talk to me afterwards. I have plenty of slides. <laughs> uh, this is an experiment on, on vector solitons that we just uh, submitted a paper on. But uh, let me just conclude by saying, um, by saying that uh, it's, I, I just wanted to sort of present some of the opportunities for collaboration that uh, areas where I see that, that there might be a fruitful collaboration between atomic physicists uh, and, uh, and people who participate in IEN. Uh, I, I think I've told you a little bit about integrating precision atomic clocks with microelectronics. Uh, and uh, so this is sort of the, the beginning of that. Okay? So what other things could we imagine? Maybe there's new types of sensing applications that we have not yet come up with. But atoms are great sensors. They can sense electric fields, magnetic fields. Are there some new types of applications that one might like to imagine? And then we can try to combine them together uh, and see, see if it works. Uh, fabrication methods. We started with silicon. Uh, maybe there's other things out there. Maybe there are other materials that might be, uh, might be useful or novel fabrication methods uh, as well. Uh, <clears throat> so our, I showed you the diode laser that we use for spectroscopy of the rubidium and for making, doing the sensing and detection. That diode laser sits in a completely different silicon, uh, sorry, uh, three, five semiconductor uh, optical cavity that's located in a different place and comes over in an optical fiber. Would be great if that laser actually were on the same chip as the, the one that, we're, that where our atoms are. So chip scale laser development and integration at 780 nanometers would be really, really great, as well as some infrared wavelengths as well for optical trapping or guiding. Uh, and in general, I'd say that anything that makes atomic systems better, more reliable, and robust, and low cost is something I am interested in. So if you have great ideas about that, I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> so with that, I'll just conclude, and thank you for your attention. Oh, briefly, let me tell you, uh, we also have a, uh, so as, as part of the quantum efforts at Georgia Tech, we started a new group called AMPIC. Atomic Molecular and Photonic Instruments on Chip for Quantum Sensing. It involves a whole bunch of faculty at Georgia Tech that are already interested in this area, including some folks at GTRI. Uh, and we have some collaborators outside. We just got a conceptualization grant to, uh, to a planning grant to write a proposal to build an institute uh, based on, on integrating atomic and molecular and photonic uh, devices with, uh, with the solid state. So uh, look forward to more on that in the future, and I'll just thank you for your attention.
Yeah, it does, but the vacuum does not have to be so high. It does have to be a moderate vacuum, but I'm, my understanding is that probably, you know, 100 microtor to millitor might be enough. Um, so the package has to be developed to, to be able to uh, keep the vacuum. That's right, yeah. You cannot keep pumping the molecules. You've got you to keep it pretty much once you pull it, you've got to keep it. That's right, yeah. And uh, so, but that kind of pack, uh, vacuum packaging has been developed. Um, so there are miniature getters that you can use for maintaining moderate vacuum. So the, basically the, the vacuum has to be such that the mean free path for collisions is longer than the size of the device. You need to be in the molecular regime. Right. So, if I were to operate this, let's say, 100 Kelvin versus room temperature, do you get better know, accuracy? So, for rubidium and alkali metals, you have to operate them at elevated temperatures. It has to be 100 C is typically kind of necessary because otherwise you'll just uh, condense. So, from this perspective, then, how about thermal stability of the entire device? Do you want to That's a great it? question. It would be great to have really good thermal stability. You need to have good few thermal gradients and okay so if you have some ideas about that that's well, the thermal management that's what we do thermal ground planes maintaining the uniform temperature a lot of microelectronics suffer from the same problem that was just saying the hot spots areas mm -hmm. so localized high temperature you want to eliminate so the thermal management we do a lot of these types of work and it's only in the microelectronics but in quantum systems it's probably the more important thing. Mm -hmm. So this is more on the packaging end, yeah, or also the chip and packaging. Classically, usually in packaging uh, level, but uh, these days more and more of this system is a microfabricated chip integrated. Think, think uh, in the following way. For example, you look at your set of micro channels. Mm -hmm. Think of another wafer level edge micro channel through which you have a flow of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, two phase flow refrigerant. And if you go through two phase flow, it's actually maintained uh, temperature at the phase transition. So it keeps everywhere, regardless of the heat flux, the entire platform at the same temperature. Right. So it's kind right. of what was called like, essentially, it's a microfabricated cold plate. Mm -hmm. We just finished the DARPA program on that and, uh, hmm. and exactly doing this type of device. Mm -hmm. So it's an integration phase change on the chip that allows you to maintain temperature. The other way you can, of course, incorporate uh, thin film uh, thermoelectric, and that would be active uh, approach to, with the feedback loop. You can even not necessarily maintain temperature here, but you can create the gradients if you want. Step up, step down. That's with the additional density. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, temperature stability is important for the collimators, but for the clock, um, and particular for the gyroscope applications where we have multiple interrogation zones, having temperature stability there could be very important yeah, because it directly translates into gyro biostability. Well, that's what I would also, I think also even temperature would affect your uh, broadness of the uh, entirely uh, velocity distribution. Yeah. Right? And um, it will impact probably some of the Doppler correction because there is still some radial velocity. Yes, yes. So this is all temperature sensitive. Yeah. I smell a budding collaboration, but are there any other questions <laughs> before we wrap up? All right, let's, let's thank 